for now. Thank you very much in, indeed for that. Um, we will now um, just move on to uh, to the consumer perspective. Um, not not mentioned too much so far um, during today's uh, today's discussion, but I have a feeling that um, Bill Words, senior policy analyst at Consumer Choice Centre, is going to educate us on that. And if not, I'll certainly put some questions to him that might shed some light on this. Bill, over to you. I absolutely will. I hope I can be. I am audible and I can be heard well. Uh, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Bill Woods and I speak on behalf of the Consumer Choice Center. Uh, just about us, the Consumer Choice Center is specifically focused on millennials and Gen Z consumers. So we endorse more choice, digital innovation, free trade, lower costs for consumers, innovative medicine and science based policymaking. Um, before I start, uh, I'd summarize our position as the following. The purpose of integrated pest management needs to be to safeguard food safety, food security, and most importantly, through the first two ones, uh, affordable food. I myself from uh, Luxembourg, from a family that had a farming background up until my father, everyone worked on a farm. And I think if my grandfather could see the innovation that exists today, it is in no way comparable to how it used to be. I realize that this is not the impression you get if you read the papers every day, but I believe we would be remiss to, to not forget our food is today healthier, safer and more affordable than ever before. Part of the reason that we have more accessible and safe food is crop protection. This is something we don't actually talk about much, nor has it been mentioned here too much. Crop protection allows us to avoid things like mycotoxin contamination, which affects millions of people around the world each year. Just to give you a number, 40% of liver cancers in Africa can be traced back to mycotoxins, which we know how to avoid with a careful use of fungicides and with adequate storage. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a regular visitor in, in Turkey and, and, it, and storage is also a big part of this. If you see in the supermarkets uh, how uh, some of the fruits and vegetables are around in the burning sun at 30 degrees Celsius, um, there, is a, there, is a, there needs to be more education about the, the storage uh, uh, of, of certain, of certain uh, fruits and vegetables and, 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 uh, and at other foods in general. So the, the concept of crop protection is essential. Uh, whether it's in conventional or in organic agriculture. We've had a lot of innovation in the field of agriculture, and we can just take some statistics there. Um, I, I'll, I'll take these ones from the, the American side, the other side of the, of the pond. Uh, since the 1960s, the use, of, the use of pesticides per acre has been reduced by 40%. Pesticides persistence has been cut in half, and the amount of active ingredients has been reduced by 95%. With integrated pest management, we can continuously improve the adequate use of pesticides. One economic reality is striking, and I think we need to understand it. Farmers do not want to use more crop protection products than they absolutely have to. Running a farm is something you do out of tradition or out of love for your job, but it's also running a business. And as everyone who's ever run a business can tell you, reducing your running costs, if you can, is never a bad idea. Integrated pest management is in the financial interests of farmers. With innovative tools and new farming equipment, such as smart sprayers, especially on big farms, we can reduce the need for certain crop protection products uh, even further. Now, you can say, of course, these are things that are, that are only uh, uh, that are expensive and only available to those farms with a large turnover, and that's true. However, as more and more farmers adopt IPM and the incentive to uh, the incentive then to mass produce certain uh, equipments brings prices down. It's a bit like electric cars. Yeah, the first ones were very expensive, and if you needed a repair tool, uh, you had a struggle finding it. But as more and more people use it, uh, this equipment gets uh, cheaper and more available, uh, both privately or commercially. Uh, reductions in pesticides shouldn't be just for the sake of reduction. However, uh, you know when we look at farm to fork, uh, we want we're now looking at this reduction target of fifty percent. Why exactly it's fifty percent is not entirely clear. But it looks good on the press release, you know, that uh, what that means for farmers, what does it mean for consumers? It's not entirely clear because impact assessments are not high on the priority list, it seems. Um, it's, it shouldn't be, the, the goals of IPM shouldn't just be uh, to, for the Commission to achieve its political targets. When the United States Department of Agriculture did an impact assessment on farm to fork, they found that we have a decline in, that we'll see a decline in agricultural production by 7 to 12 percent. The EU's decline in GDP would present 76% of the decline in worldwide GDP, and the situation of food security and food commodity prices would be deteriorating significantly under a worldwide adoption scenario. That would mean if farm to fork were to be implemented globally, we would see significant complications for consumers and farmers. 
So the commission did not share the conclusions of USDA. Uh, Commissioner Kirikidis says in a written response to an MEP, uh, uh, quote, the study ignores the effects of the farm to fork strategy on productivity growth, reducing food demand by its ambition to curb food waste and uh, food waste and losses, and by a shift towards healthy, balanced and sustainable diets. Uh, I'm sorry, but as an answer, that's not good enough to me. Um, what I also believe is that we need to address the unintended consequences. If we reduce the toolbox available to farmers in terms of pesticides that they can use, they may turn to the illicit market. This is something we don't talk about very often. It's very, very present in, de in developing nations. It's not as present in, in developed countries, but it's something that we might increase if we, re if we, um, if we restrict the toolbox. And illicit pesticides purchased on the black market, that means considerable health hazards for consumers and also for the farmers using it. And it's something that we need to look at how we can avoid that while reducing the use of crop protection tools. Now, I'm not sure if you checked out the situation of young people recently, but with or without COVID-19, us in the range of 20 to 30 are generally pretty broke. Uh, we can't buy, buy our own real estate. Any savings we bring in, uh, any savings that we have bring in no interest and our purchasing power is fading away. But when asked about agriculture, Commissioner Timmermans tells the Agri Committee in May last year, this is while millions of young people are worried about their existence, that, quote, we've gotten used to food being too cheap. And I have a problem with that kind of statement. Sure, in my home country, Luxembourg, and in the Netherlands as well, people choose to buy organic at premiums of up to 100% because they can, because they want to, because they mistakenly believe that organic food uses no pesticides, despite the fact that it does. That's the prerogative of each consumer. You have those choices. Um, but we also need to look at what that means economically. In Luxembourg, household spending on food is less than 10% of total expenditure on average. In Romania, it's 25%. Saying that food is too cheap is an ivory tower kind of statement, but also the kind of statement you make if you only shop at your organic store at Schumann Metro Station in Brussels. But that's not where most consumers live and shop. The title of this event sort of asks us how we can make agriculture more sustainable through integrated pest management. I realize that some organizations and political groups are keen on using the conversation about IPM to disincentivize synthetic pesticides overall, or even phase it out to go more and more for an organic, organic food model. Here again, the option for conventional and organic food needs to be a choice, a choice that farmers make and the choice that consumers get to make. Organic food is not a one size fits all solution and it actually deserves criticism from a sustainability perspective. Uh, so if we talk about sustainability, it is not just taking, talking about the environment, it also means addressing the social sustainability, meaning the effects on consumers. And since I've been allocated just a little bit more time, new breeding technologies provide an amazing opportunity for Europe, and it's something we need to talk about more. It's an unfortunate irony that a European scientist, Emmanuel Charpentier, develops CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology, but is then, we largely are not allowed to use this in Europe. Countries like the United States, Canada and Brazil are far ahead of us in these technologies that allow us to phase out pesticides in the long run if we wish to do so. For that, we need to embrace innovation, and I'm happy that the European Commission last week opened that conversation. Um, and, uh, and on that point, now I realize that for many in the European Parliament, this will cause significant distress having that conversation, but I think for the sake of consumers, that's a price worth accepting. Uh, thank you for your attention. Bill, thanks um, so much. Lots of questions actually coming through um, in, the, in the chat function, but I'm gonna just try and build on a couple of them. I mean, first of all, um, IPM um, and the principles that sit behind it. Is that something that consumers will pay for, do you think? Um, or can we find ways for consumers to, to do that? Um, and then because you've got the consumer angle in your uh, title, and there is a question here, um, should, we, should, should the European Union, I suppose in this trade diplomacy, insist that anybody importing pro produce into the EU, which EU consumers will, um, will purchase and, and consume, should they be held to the same standards as producers in the um, in the European Union? I.e., um, they, they 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 shouldn't out, producers outside of Europe shouldn't be getting an unfair advantage. And um, perspective on those two questions would be great. Well, let me let me let me start with the last one first. Uh, the uh, the question on, on the trade relationship, and we have the same exact conversation on carbon border adjustment. Uh, it's it's always the sustainability uh, um, um, conversation on trade. When we talk about this. Uh, 
when Donald Trump implemented certain tariffs on products, he said, well, this is in order to support our national industry. And now we do the exact same thing, but we just have a different perspective. We just say it's used for sustainability. If consumers want to purchase products from abroad, from across other continents, and it's clearly labeled what country it's from, it, the consumers are, are free to choose to look these things up. I'm not sure if you, I mean, when you go to uh, uh, any supermarket these days, a lot of consumers use their phones to scan barcodes and actually look up the products that they buy. We shouldn't assume that consumers are unable to make these choices for themselves. And I think um, when you have uh, a, a, a shop that sells products from Argentina, well, you you need to realize that these products are produced in Argentina and we shouldn't request these products to be produced in the exact same way that we do it in Europe. Now, if uh, European consumers get used to a certain standard and they want to see that applied as well, then maybe Argentinian producers will adhere to these principles and will label that accordingly. Every time we have these conversations about labeling, um, we we should label according to what is scientifically based. Uh, if EFSA says that certain products can be used safely, well, then we need to accept that, right? I mean, it's the, 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 high, the entire question of reduction targets 50%, as I never quite understood this, like is the other 50% that we're reducing from, was that unsafe according to the scientific agency that we're relying on? It never quite makes sense to me uh, that, because that's that's why we know that this 50% target is, is purely political. So I think consumers should be free to choose from other continents. As for IPM, um, I think, uh, 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 wait, uh, let me just, what was your question again? Just for me to. Uh, so, so, so the question is in, in a yeah. similar kind of vein, do, you know, do, do consumers, do they understand IPM? Oh, right. Are they willing, and the same yeah, are they willing organic, to pay for it? And will yeah. they pay for it? Yeah, um, well, cer certain consumers will and certain consumers already are. I think if there's, if there's an understanding to exactly to, to what extent uh, that uh, is, is beneficial for them, then, then sure, but ultimately the question is, is the food that we buy today unsafe already? If the, if the implication of, uh, of the, the, the current use on, on certain crop protection tools is that they're unhealthy, well, that should be, they, they should not be allowed, right? Uh, EFSA and ECHA, they make, they make, they make assessments. And for what we know right now, they are not uh, un, unhealthy for consumption. So if consumers want to support their local farmers integrating new systems in order to uh, uh, in order to, to 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 save on certain crop protection tools, then absolutely, and that's their prerogative. And I think with positive labeling, we're able to do that. A lot of companies and a lot of producers already positively label. I mean, we often have this conversation about labeling being mandatory to say that something is not included or something is included. But there's also positive labeling, and positive labeling means you can put on your on on, on your on your packaging whatever you want, and you can say, well, this was produced in a certain uh, way, and it and it uses new new technology. So I think I think. There again, it, it, it ought to be up to the producers to exactly how to communicate that to, uh, to consumers and for consumers to make free choices in the supermarkets. We're not all the same. You know, young consumers consume very differently from old consumers. And we also like we are a continent of uh, immigration. You know, we have a lot of people from all around the world coming to Europe and they have different preferences and they want to buy certain uh, products uh, in, in, in accordance to, to, to the way that they had it at home and they should have the right to do so. Well, um, Bill, thanks very much indeed for that. I don't know if you can see it or if um, other participants that are watching can see it, but um, your intervention has, has provoked a number of questions, too many that uh, I just can't get to um, in, in, in this session. But you might take a, a look at a couple of those. There's a, a bit one about affordability of food versus affordability of, of water and um, pesticides and water resources and so forth. You might want to take that on um, uh, bilaterally. But Bill, thank you very much indeed for that. And, and so it, it brings us to our last intervention of 